that blessed assurance that we can be with you forever. Thank you, Jesus. You come out here to talk about parenting styles? You know we have a sensitive daughter, Jace. She cries when you look at her sideways, never mind the tone of voice you use with her. Sorry I haven't read as many parenting books as you, but maybe she just needs to learn to cope. Not getting to read a book before bed is not the end of the world. You use the same tone of voice with me. Sometimes you cry when you don't get to read your Kindle at night. Me, I'm more of a Netflix guy, so it's really not Stop. a- Stop. Okay, just stop it. Everything is a joke with you. I feel like we're not communicating anymore. Okay. This is about us. Oh, you, you communicate great. Yeah, with the way you undermine me, all the time in front of her, and every, in front of everyone for that matter, our, our friends, our family. You cut my legs off at the knees and it's emasculating. You do that all on your own, Jace. We're supposed to be rubbing off on each other. We're supposed to be finding the good in one another. Yeah. Not just you affecting me. So what am I missing? I feel like... Like I'm the one doing all the bending. I know how much I've changed what? over the years. Are and if you, you kidding just... me? You're, you're doing all the bending. You are. You used to. When we first got married, everything was just so... We were different. We were... We were kids. What are you not saying? I'm just saying... You never want to talk about us. Well, that's calling the kettle black, isn't it? Coming from the person that makes indirect comments about everything I say and do because you're so afraid of conflict? Why don't you just come out and say it? I'm not like you, and that's the problem, right? Well, surely I'm of some use to you. You're not just here for my benefit. I'm here for you, too. I'm just telling you that you could just And I'm lie. telling you I'm not your father. Sorry. I love you. I love her daughter. I'm not going anywhere. But I'm not your dad, and I'm being punished for the way he treated you, and then it's not fair. Right. So I guess I'm just some poster child for daddy issues. All in one sentence. Congratulations. I'm glad we got that settled. That's not what I said. You misunderstood me. I'm going to bed. We used to assume the good. We used to... We used to see the best in each other. Are you able to see the best in your family? If not, you're not alone, and God desires to help you through this struggle. And he desires to speak some very pointed counsel into your life for your family. I want to thank you for joining us for our online service, and I am so glad that you tuned in to today's message on the broken family. Over the next few weeks, we will be examining God's biblical design for all of our relationships. Today, as we discuss the family unit, we're going to examine why it is oftentimes broken and dysfunctional and what we should do about it. Why are there so many problems and issues with the family unit? Why is the modern family so dysfunctional, and why is it so important that we get this thing right? The first institution? 
that God created for the welfare of mankind was the family. God, he brought it together through a covenant relationship to becoming one. The family was designed by God to be the building blocks on which to build strong civilizations. So if you want to look at the viability of any church, any neighborhood, any city or country, simply look to the strength of its families. For example, of how this plays out in real time, we're going to look to Pew Research, a secular polling agency. Recently, they did a poll that shows the direct connection between college graduation and strong marriages and households. So according to Pew Research, in 1960, the height of the post-World War II baby boom, there was one dominant family form. At that time, 73% of all children were living in a family with two married parents in their first marriage together. In 1980, 61% of children were living in this type of family. And today, less than half, around 46% are. What impact has this had on our children and their pursuit for higher education? According to the Pew Research poll, the ethnicities with the highest first marriage, you know, two-parent homes, also had the highest college graduation rates for their children. Conversely, ethnicities or cultures with the least first marriage two-parent homes experience the least college graduation rates for their children. Let's see how this boils out. Asian Americans had the highest first marriage two-parent homes at 71%, and these families accounted for 67% of all Asian college grads. At the other end of the spectrum, the black American families only see 22% first marriage two-parent homes. Yet, that 22%, they also account for 67% of all black college graduates in America. That 22% is making a huge difference. Enough cannot be said about the importance of protecting our marriages and our families. Why is there so much turmoil in our homes then? Why so much discord? Why so much brokenness and dysfunction all around us? Today, I want to offer you three truths for you to take home and apply into your families. The first principle we need to be aware of and have our eyes open to it is because there is a spiritual warfare against your family. Some of this isn't even about us. One of the sad realities within the local church today centers on the fact that numerous born-again Christians have little or no knowledge of the spiritual warfare that takes place all around us. Going all the way back to the garden, the first shots against the marriage occurred in the very beginning. In Genesis 1 and 2, God created a perfect universe, a perfect environment, and then he placed our first parents into that magnificent environment, a beautiful garden, two becoming one in marriage, and also included God walking with them and with the creator in fellowship. Who could ask for anything more? But into this perfect scene, the evil one descended, casting doubt about God's sincerity and care and concern and his provision. We pick up the storyline in Genesis 3 as the serpent engages our first parents. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any trees in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The eyes of both of them were opened. And they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, 
I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I've commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave some of the fruit to me from the tree, and I I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent, he deceived me, and I ate it. (laughs) If this wasn't so serious, it would be funny. Did you notice all the finger pointing going on here? Just look at this total dysfunction that is occurring. Remember this. Don't forget this. Sin leads to dysfunction and brokenness, always. It separates us from God's plans, his provision, and his fellowship. Their sin, much like our sin, was instigated through a spiritual warfare, a satanic attack on the family unit. Maybe you ask yourself, why does the devil spend so much time trying to hurt our families? The truth of the matter is, he doesn't even care about you. He doesn't even care about your marriages and your families. He's actually trying to hurt God. You see, Satan, he can't hurt God. He is limited in resource and strength. So he focuses against the triune God by assaulting and damaging God's people in general and the Christian home in particular, by tearing apart the covenant family that God had modeled by his design. The devil now presents to the world brokenness, dysfunction, and confusion. And in doing so, he attempts to lead the masses onto a pathway of separation from God. Remember this, the next time you are looking into the brokenness of your family, trying to discern where to start, remember all of our families are under a spiritual warfare against the enemy of our souls. We need to take this to the Lord, begin in prayer. Secondly, as a result of the fall, all families are dysfunctional and broken. But God still loves us. Aren't you glad for this? It's a reality. Dysfunction is everywhere, and all of us are a part of it. But thanks be unto God, his grace and his mercy that is new each day is reaching to all of us. I wonder what classic best describes what your family is like. Happy days, war and peace, or the fight club? (laughs) Repeat after me. There's no such thing as a perfect family. When we understand this, we then should begin encouraging each other on this long journey that we all have in front of us, not just in our own households, but extending beyond our walls of our homes. We should be encouraging other households and families with the same reality. So I have a short message for two different people groups today. Let's talk about the first group that I want to target, and that's this. They are those who pretend that nothing is wrong. You know, that perfect John and Sally family. Hey, listen, quit lying. We already know you're not perfect. The gig is up. Stop pretending. There is something very valuable that you need to take away from today's teaching through Scripture. The next group I want to target are those that think that they're the only ones that have family problems, and they're afraid to be open because in a church setting, when people are smiling and happy and perfect, they feel like they're the only ones doing something wrong. All I want to say is enough with finger pointing. It didn't work in the garden. It won't work here. Stop deflecting and taking our attention from where it should be so that we can, through the Spirit, put it right where it needs to be our covenant relationships in the home, our family altars, our spiritual well-being, and our commitment one to another. You're not alone in this struggle, friends. All families are born into brokenness, and as a result, all of us will be somewhat dysfunctional, some visibly more than others. But it's a simple fact that we need to embrace so that we can move forward with loving our families with an unconditional love. You see, blaming our families, our parents, our siblings, our spouses, or how about this? It seems to be a current trend, blaming our grandparents, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents for their indiscretions. All of this is not productive. It's like blaming the elephant for being fat. It just is. Repeat this after me. 
I may be dysfunctional, but Jesus loves me anyway. Thank you, Jesus. Did you know that Jesus' own family was dysfunctional? Let that sink in for a second. Jesus knew what it was like to grow up with a stepdad. Mary was his mother, but Joseph was not his earthly father. Were you aware that Jesus grew up with step-siblings? The Gospel of Mark chapter 6 and the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, they mention the names of his siblings. James, Joseph, also called Joseph, Judas, called Jude, and Simon, as brothers of Jesus, the son of Mary. In fact, the same verses also mention unnamed sisters of Jesus. We don't even know who they are. And the fact is, none of his siblings believed a word that was coming out of his mouth about him being God's one and only son. His brothers at one time even tried to get him to present himself as Messiah before God's appointed time in his life in order to get him killed. Ooh, you want to talk about dysfunction. You see, Jesus, he might have been the perfect son, even the son of God, but being the perfect son was not enough to prevent normal family dysfunction. And neither will you. You can't prevent it either. Adam and Eve, the first family, totally filled with dysfunction. They broke God's commands. Then they lied to God's face in the garden. Their first son killed their second son. And this is totally messed up. It's like a soap opera. How about Abraham, the father of our faith? We trace our Judeo-Christian values right back to him even more dysfunctional. Think about his storyline. In Genesis 12, we know that God, he calls Abram at age 75. And God tells him, I'm gonna make you into a great nation. Abram had been living in Canaan about 10 years. He was 85 years of age, and his wife finally offered her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, to him to sleep with in order to conceive a son. Abraham, now 86 years of age, is now sired and father of Ishmael. Ishmael was born in Genesis 16. 13 years later, God now told Abram that he was to be called Abraham, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And he says that you will have a son by your wife, Sarah. And he laughed. He laughed at the thought of having a son at 100 years of age, and Sarah now being 90 years of age. Here's the takeaway. Don't laugh at God. Abraham was 100, 100 when Isaac was born to him by Sarah. Genesis 21, verse 5. Can you think of a more dysfunctional setting than a great, great, great grandfather raising a son? Wow, that must have been quite a sight. I can go through the word of God from cover to cover, and I can show you complete brokenness and dysfunction that affects every single family. Job's wife told him to curse God and die. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. Wait, can I even say that word in church? My point, all families are broken. They're all dysfunctional. So stop pretending and start the healing process. Experience what God really wants you to know about the family of God. And that leads me to our third and final point of discussion this morning. Are you aware that God desires to heal our broken families? What is the state of your marriage? What is the state of your home? Is it broken? Is it dysfunctional? Do you feel compelled to walk away? Understand something. God's plan is to help you understand you're not alone in this. He wants you to know that there's healing and potential restoration for you. Mankind he experienced brokenness and dysfunction as a result of the fall. But God, he loves us enough not to leave us in that damaged, broken state. He gives us plenty. He gives us hope and promise of a coming Messiah who would restore all things. Jesus Christ came, lived a sinless life, and offered himself as an atoning sacrifice on the cross for the healing of all of us. Then he sent his word to heal all of our disease, all of our dysfunction, all of our brokenness. We would be wise to remember that the family alienation occurred as a result of disobeying God's commands. 
Do you know why there's so much brokenness in some of our homes? It's because God's word has been ignored. So what can we do about that? Family reconciliation results from placing God's word, one more time, at the center of our hearts and in the center of our households. As parents, as husbands and wives, we need to live out and model reverence and obedience to the word of the Lord. By example, we should bring daily repentance before the eyes of our family. The altars of prayer and and repentance, they need to be restored within our Christian households. As we close, let let us all be encouraged by God's promise to the broken family. Hear his words in Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. See, our God, he is the God of the impossible. Even your family is not too lost. Even your family is likely not too broken. When we bring the word of God back to the center, when we are the repenters, when we are the ones restoring faith in our hearts and believing the best in our families again. Our God is in the process of healing people because he loves us too much to leave us in a broken situation. As we close today, I want to pray pastorally a prayer over you. Perhaps you've never received the salvation that comes through the Lord. Today, I want to ask you to take that step of faith to believe God for his interaction with you. He's calling you in your confusion, like Adam and Eve in the garden. He knows that you have fallen. He knows that you've experienced embarrassment and shame. He's not here to ridicule you. He's here to bring you to a place of repentance so that you can be restored again. So first, as we pray, may we pray that prayer of eternal restoration where our souls are secure in the presence of the Lord. Then, I want to pray for all of our families that we would begin to let healing occur, that we would pray that God would let fresh repentance in our hearts as individuals begin to happen. In other words, no more finger pointing. No more blaming the one we believe to be responsible for this. Let us bring our lives to the table. Let us bring our hearts as part of resolution. And let us begin by asking God to help us start seeing and believing the best in our families again. Lord, I thank you for your great love. We all wandered in darkness. We all experienced the wrath of fall the original sin, the suffering and the confusion and the dysfunction, all of these are just manifestations of our separation from our Father in heaven. And so, Lord, today we ask, I pray that there would be one hearing these words who would take a moment, be introspective enough to examine their state of the fall, their position of brokenness, and lift their hearts and their hands to heaven confessing their sin and need of a Savior, one who rescues them from their brokenness, one who lifts them from their struggle, and one who offers them life eternal through his one and only eternal sacrifice on the cross on our behalf. By faith, Lord, we confess you are Lord, and we believe in your death, burial, and resurrection. You conquered the impossible, death, hell, and the grave. If you can do that, you can give us love and hope and belief in our own family. So, Lord, I pray. I pray for the dysfunction and brokenness that exists, and I know where it comes from. So I speak against the heavenlies right now, where this warfare begins, 
when Satan comes against our households. He is in glee every time doors are slammed, unkind words are spoken, and people storm out as enemies. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will in fact open our eyes to realize there is an instigator behind this and that we would not see our spouse or our parents or our children as the enemy, but again, those caught up in this brokenness. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will come into our homes and reestablish the altars of repentance and prayers. Let husbands and wives, let moms and dads, Let them lead their families by example, by kneeling their knees before the word of God, confessing their need for healing, offering their repentant apologies for their mistakes and grievances so that true restoration of heart can happen. Lord, may our families, may our Christian homes, may they be beacons of hope to a broken world. May they see Jesus in our marriage. May your love for your church shine through our covenant relationships. And may people see Jesus as a result of the love we have one for another. And I pray this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. My friends, if you missed our first week in this lesson, Well, we talked about what biblical love looks like. Today, we talked about why is there so much brokenness and dysfunction. I want to encourage you to come back and join us next week as we take one more step as we examine the process by which God restores our family units. I thank you for joining us, and I bless you in Jesus' name.